coming up to the uh, Christmas break. And uh, <coughs> usually you have some holidays, so that gives us a chance to uh, have a break and do some things we maybe haven't been able to do during the year. Bring Christmas brings with us special temptations for our spiritual life, like office parties. <laughs> which uh, is interesting from a Buddhist cosmological point of view as being a kind of a uh, a synthesis of, of heaven and hell at the same time but uh, so it's good to when we have the chance to have a break um, we're not um, overly endowed with uh, uh, rest and relaxation time these days. And uh, by the time we've finished uh, slaving in, in service to all of our labor-saving labor devices, uh, we don't seem to have a lot of time left over. It really struck me. Uh, a few years ago when I was doing a hospital visit to somebody who was dying of cancer in hospital and uh, I noticed as I was sitting there trying to um, communicate with this person and trying to see how they're feeling and try to, to help them to, 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 to you know, give them some spiritual nurturing. And I noticed just sitting there watching the, the, the nurses and the doctors come around and uh, servicing the machines. Yeah? And there's all these kids kind of surrounded by machines. And, uh, and everyone's coming and attending to them. There's a button flash on the machine. So you come and you look at the machine and make sure that the, the machine is okay. And then kind of go <laughs> off. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So... So we have a break. Hopefully, most of you, uh, been, if you've been working during the year, you hopefully have at least a, a few days or a few weeks uh, break. And so please use your time well. And remember that a, a, a holiday is actually a holy day, isn't it? Yeah, this is where it comes from. It's supposed to, a holiday is supposed to be a holy day. And uh, so... Use it well. Yeah? Take the time to uh, visit the monastery or the temple. Uh, take the time to spend some quiet days. Don't schedule things for every day, but take some time to just, just do nothing. Uh, don't, um, you know, you don't have to feel driven to, uh, you know, doing all of those house repairs or cleaning or something like that that you've, you've left, uh, you know, left over from the year. Just, uh, it's important to take it easy, yeah. And uh, there's one um, nice saying when when uh, of Ajahn Chah, and uh, when they were starting the rains retreat, because we have like a three month retreat period each year where we we set aside um, you know the majority of our, our work and any building or development that's happening in the monastery and and activities and things. And uh, there was this building project that was half completed. And, uh, and somebody said, what are you going to do about this, this project that's not finished? And Ajahn Chah said, it's finished. And he said, how can you say it's finished? The roof isn't on. The walls aren't done yet. He said, what's done is finished. Yeah. <laughs> Some of it's done and those bits are finished. Yeah. So that's really important because that's, that's actually a very beautiful metaphor for our life because you know life isn't like a kind of a defined project where you can do X, Y, Z and at the end of it you say, right, it's finished. Yeah? 
life goes on every day. Yeah? We don't finish life. There's no point where you reach in your life and you think, right, here, every, this is all the things I wanted to do with my life. That's it. I've finished now. Whoop. Oh, well, might as well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what, what, what are all the things I wanted to do with my life, you know. Read War and Peace. I want to... So life's not that kind of thing. Yeah, and we make like this idea we have projects or things we want to do. It's kind of an artificial imposition on life. Um, but if we look at how animals live and how most human cultures live, uh, that that they live not in terms of this kind of drive to constantly being creating and making things, but they live in a way that that responds uh, and, and is in tune with their environment and with the nature. And of course, this is one of the, um, you know, this is basically what human culture, what we, we call civilization is, isn't it? Is, is, is an attempt to, is when you stop saying uh, we're going to adapt to nature and you start saying we're going to adapt nature to us. Yeah? So all of those little things that we think of as take for granted, like, say, growing your own food. Yeah? So these kind of steps towards the development of culture instead of just taking what the environment gives us we're going to plant the food that we want to eat. Yeah, uh, um, lighting fires. So instead of saying in the hot will be hot and the cold will be cold, you say no, no, we're going to light a fire. Yeah, and uh, so you're changing the environment to suit your own uh, needs. That's where human culture comes from. And of course, we get further and further down that track, and uh, <coughs> we don't know what the outcome of that is. Yeah? This is not a kind of a planned process that's, that's, that's designed according to a, a well-understood uh, uh, goal that we know where this is heading and we've, we've set, it's completely built up out of billions and billions of, 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 of uh, uh, random choices which individual humans make uh, and make as individuals and as cultures, societies and so on all of which is leading to some kind of end, which we don't know. What will that end be? Yeah? Are all the, the sea levels going to rise by 100 metres, as some of the predictions from, from NASA says, by the end of the century? Sea levels will be up by 100 metres. <coughs> the oil, is the oil going to run out? The latest findings from, from the, um, what is it, the International Energy Commission? <laughs> A very interesting article this week in The, in the Guardian. And they've just uh, uh, halved the amount of time before they reach peak oil. Before, I think they were saying 2030, and now they're saying it's 2015 to 2020 or something. And uh, they say, why did you change your figures so much? They say, well, before we didn't actually measure it. We just guessed. It was only in the last year we've actually measured the amount of oil that's there. <laughs> if you, uh, I find it quite extraordinary, but that's, that's, it's, that's, that's what they say. So... The oil's going to run out, the ice caps are going to melt, water's going to run out in the dry places, and disease will spread, political instability, fundamentalism, global warming. So just have a nice holiday and just don't worry about it. <laughs> I mean, what can you do in the end, you know? If if more people just 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 didn't you know didn't worry about things, then then we a lot of those things wouldn't be happening, would they? Yeah? And uh, it's interesting that if you look at these causes of of uh, uh, destruction in in the society, in the culture and environment, it's interesting to see the the causes which the Buddha talked about, uh, and there's certain suttas where he discussed. Uh, how society disintegrates and what are the causes that lead to you know, harmony and, and uh, um, uh, prosperity within society and what are the causes that lead away from it. And, uh, of course, one of the, the most basic things that he pointed to was greed and that when people act uh, out of greed and selfishness, then that's, this leads to 
um, puts, puts, leads to pressures and inequalities in the society. And he, he, he particularly made a point of pointing to inequality as being a, a very powerful source of uh, injustice and strife and conflict in the world. This is very basic to the Buddhist way of thinking. If, if in, in, in society, uh, the Buddha was always arguing against the caste system in India. Yeah? And caste system sort of institutionalizes a strata of society. You've got the better ones and the, and the, and the kind of layers. And the Buddha said, this, this doesn't make any sense. You know? we're, not, we're not defined by where we're born. So, uh, and he gave the example that uh, <clears throat> if you look in the animal realm, you can see that the animals are, are clearly d differentiated according to what species that they're born in. You know, a cow is a cow, a snake is a snake, a fish is a fish. And they're, they're um, constrained within that particular nature. But for humans, it's not like that. For humans, we're born as humans and we're not defined by where we're born, but we're defined by how we act, yeah? what we do with our lives. Yeah? We're, all, we're all born pretty much the same, not exactly the same, but pretty much the same. But our lives, we shape our lives by our choices. Yeah? So what do we do with our lives? Do we live our lives in a good way or do we live our life in a bad way? That's our choice. So this idea of a caste system as, as predestining people to, to be in a stratified sense of society, well, you know, this is, uh, he, you know, the Buddha said, well, this is something which, um, you know, the, the, the kind of the Brahmins have invented. In India, the Brahmins trying to set themselves up as the highest caste, and they've kind of invented and tried to, to fob it off on everybody else, yeah, and say, you know, you have to accept this social order that places you underneath. So, of course, we see much the same thing in the world today. And, in fact, even though we have the ideals of equality, you know, we have this theory that of equality and human rights and everything, but the reality is that it's much more une une unequal. Yeah? And we tend to be a bit um, uh, superior. We, we think about these things. We think, oh, yeah, it's terrible. Caste system's terrible, right? Whereas, in fact, you, know, you could make a serious argument to say that it's, it's much more honest, than the system that we run under. Yeah? At least they're acknowledging the fact that they're unequal. Yeah? At least they're honest about it. And we're pretending that we're equal, but the reality is that we're much more une unequal. Yeah? And our society today is far more unequal than any society in the past. And not only is it more unequal, but the, the rate of split of inequality has been multiplying tremendously. So that the, the as... Um, <coughs> as uh, uh, as, oh, I've forgotten, tall Pete Garrett, tall bald head rock singer Pete Garrett said many years ago, the rich get richer and the poor get the picture. <laughs> so, you know, the, the, the extent to which the, the, uh, 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 Inequality happens is just becoming more and more obscene. You know, in Dubai they're now they're now having a refrigerated beach. Yeah, they're refrigerating the water on one of the beaches there, so that you can have you can have a cooler swim if you want to. You don't have to have the swim in the warm water. So. One of the things that the Buddha pointed to was that. Um, uh, that you know, when 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 even on a very very simple level, you know, if if somebody has more, you know, a good piece of land and more food they can grow on it, and someone has a worse piece of land, less food than they can grow on it, then there's going to be jealousy and strife between those people. How do you get over that jealousy and strife? Well, those people who have more have to be generous in helping those people who have less. Yeah? I mean, that's one of the ways that you do it. That, that those who are rich have to, they're obliged, it's a moral obligation, to share what they have with the poor. Yeah? And to, to keep that moving around. Of course, you know, on a social level, you can't trust the rich to do that. <laughs> so you have to... Uh, uh, probably have have kind of social requirements and so on as well as that, but on a moral level, 
If somebody has wealth, then they should share that with the poor. And it's, it's obscene to, to you know, uh, be kind of indulging in uh, ever more uh, wealth and, and, uh, and luxury uh, in the face of so much poverty in the world. It's just, it's just wrong. And uh, so as Buddhists, we should be very sensitive to this and we shouldn't uh, tolerate it. Yeah? It's not right to have some pe a few people having so much wealth and then other people uh, starving. Yeah? So we should do what we can. Yeah? So that doesn't mean that uh, we have to give away everything that we have. Yeah? It means that we should give away some of it, and we should we should see what we can can do to to share and to help others, and we should do that. Okay, we're not obliged to to uh, um, beggar ourselves. Okay, so the Buddha didn't say that you should, um, uh, you know, you should yourself be starving or whatever. Yeah, quite the contrary. You know, if you work, then you you earn the. Uh, results of your labor and and then you should enjoy that yeah and you should use that wealth the money that you've got to enjoy yourself and have a good life for yourself and for your family as well yeah and that's 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 what you should do uh, but the excess the surplus of that uh, that should be used to to help others yeah. so this is something to be thinking about at Christmas time yeah and uh, one of the things that we do at Christmas is that we, uh, as a society, is that we burn off our surplus, yeah? And uh, uh, so everybody's all kind of money and so on, they've saved up during the year, you spend money on, on presents and, and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, I remember, you know, what, what should we do with that? I remember one time uh, somebody told me that f for Ajahn Sumedho's birthday, that the, the in England that the people had got together and uh, raised some money and given some some funds to a charity, for I think a children's charity in the third world, and uh, and gave that to Arjun Sumedho as his birthday present. Yeah, that they, they'd raised this money for charity, and he said that was the best birthday present he'd ever got in his life. Yeah, so this may be something to think about at Christmas time, uh, instead of having to buy uh, expensive things for everyone and uh, giving. People already have too many things <laughs> and giving them even more, uh, then maybe think about that. Maybe think about off making an offering to charity on people's behalf uh, and doing that act of kindness. Yeah? And uh, then we can, the way we can share our generosity around with each other. So the, the act of doing nothing is also a sacred time. Yeah, and uh, you know that from 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 uh, uh, the book of Genesis, and the the Hebrew people said God rested on the seventh day. Yeah, now it's a very beautiful uh, myth, the, the opening the opening story in in Genesis, and uh, God created the world in seven days and then rested on the seventh day. And you read it, and it's very beautiful poetry. It's very evocative and very powerful. But as well as being uh, a kind of uh, a great piece of spiritual literature, it's also uh, perhaps the earliest recorded example of um, uh, like a workplace agreement. Yeah? And that actual particular text was uh, composed in about 600 BC, while 6 700 BC while the the Hebrews were in uh, in slavery in captivity in Babylon and uh, so they were um, serving their Babylonian uh, leaders and of course in that situation then you're very subject to exploitation and uh, so so they came up with this mythology which uh, they could present to the Babylonians and say, we have this ancient sacred tradition which says that we have to rest on the seventh day. Right? God says we have to rest on the seventh day. Right? So because you turn it into a religious problem and the, and the Babylonians were not unreasonable people, okay? so they said, all right, well, you know, rest on the seventh day. Yeah? So they get a day off. Yeah, and so that's how that's how people did things in the ancient world. That's that's you know things were happened according to a divine precedent. 
So it was, on the one hand, uh, a, a sacred day, yeah? something that was very holy, a holy day, but also it was a, it was a, it was a piece of industrial relations legislation, yeah? and uh, a very effective one. It still works today. Yeah, probably the most successful piece of industrial relations legislation ever composed. Think about that. You know, I mean, well, John Howard, his workplace stuff, and it's already being repealed. It only lasted a couple of years. Yeah, and, uh, and but this has been going for two and a half thousand years, and we still have our Sundays off. Yeah, it should be Saturday, of course, but uh, the Christians change that. But that's another story. We get Saturday and Sunday usually, so it's twice as good. Uh, and so that, you know, we think of that act of doing nothing as being a holy day, yeah? So, you know, you can wake up in the morning, you know, on your holidays, you can just sit there and think, right, I'm doing nothing. I'm helping the world by doing nothing, see? I'm not creating any pollution, a little bit of carbon dioxide, but <laughs> that's about it. And, you know, I'm not, you know, you know, you don't have to be consuming things, you don't have, you know, and they are. Think of all the all the electricity I can save, all the petrol I can save, all of these things, and I can just sit here and just do nothing. And how much good you're doing for the world. Yeah? So the you know the human beings are a part of nature. We're not we're not something separate from nature. And we evolved within Yeah, it's even difficult to, to, to use the word, even the word environment is a bit problematic because the environment is, in a sense, you have a thing and the environment is the thing which is around the thing. Yeah? So once you've, you talk about the environment, is already something that's different from the thing itself. So we think about us and the environment as if we're not part of it. Of course, we're, it's actually just a natural system. Yeah? We're, we're one, one little aspect of that natural system. And <clears throat> so... Even though human culture has uh, evolved and developed in a way which um, seems to conflict with nature very often, uh, still we're part of that system in some peculiar way. Like if we look around at this building, you know, we see all these straight lines. Yeah? And uh, of course it's something you don't see in nature is straight lines. And so we've taken these things, like these beams and this roof, yeah? they're taken from iron ore, yeah? and we're living in Australia. Everywhere you go around, when you drive around and you see the, the, the earth in Australia, yeah? at Santi Monastery, we see the rocks, and they have this deep, rich yellow colour, yeah? and often you can even see the, 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 the blood red colour of the iron, yeah? and you can see this, the iron in the rocks, and some of them have a pink colour, and that, that red is always the colour of the iron ore. Yeah? And so that's actually the, 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 the steel which is in the earth. Yeah? And so we take that and then we melt it. A huge amount of energy that it takes. Yeah? Imagine that, just taking millions and millions of tonnes of rock and melting it. Yeah? That's what they have to do to make steel. Yeah? An incredible amount of energy it takes to do that. Uh, and then the purification process and so on extracting the bit of it that we want and then creating these very abstract designs. So we impose our idea of an abstract design. There's a Euclidean geometry going on here. Yeah? Because the straight line is the shortest distance between two points. Yeah? And so we put these abstract, uh, created in these abstract shapes so we can do, we can form the world to our convenience so that we can have a nice place. We can be sheltered from the wind and the rain. Yeah, we can have a clean environment. All of the things that we we uh, appreciate as as cultured or civilized human beings, and all of that comes at a cost. And the more sophisticated everything becomes, uh, the more cost there is. Yeah, the the, the the more technology goes along, the more energy is involved you know, to to create. Uh, smaller and more sophisticated things and creating silicon chips and so on, you have more energy uh, invested in just tiny little, tiny little bits. So this is the cost of civilization. And we don't know 
we really don't know what the outcome of that is. We're, we're conducting this massive experiment and really nobody has a clue what's going to happen. The only, we, know that, we know that it's all going to come to an end. That bit's straightforward. <laughs> we just don't know when. Yeah? So maybe it might be a few million years. Maybe it might be a few thousand. Maybe it might be next year. Maybe it might be before Christmas. Yeah? We really don't know. So I think that that, that you would take this time, this Christmas time, as a, as a time for reflection, you know, when, when you can step back from the hustle, step back from the, the, the kind of the, the pushing and the driving, uh, from the expectations, you know, so many so many expectations we have at work, you know, we need to do so many things, we so many skills demanded of us. And where we feel so uh, impelled to measure ourselves by our competency. We feel that we should be able to do those things that we're being asked to do and there's something wrong with us if we don't. Yeah. Actually, there's, no, there's nothing wrong <laughs> with not being able to do stuff, you know. Someone, someone says, oh, can you do you know, something on the computer? You, you don't know how to... Well, you haven't evolved to use a computer, right? There's nothing innate in humanity that says you should be able to use XYZ software, yeah? And there's no, there's no kind of moral failing in not being able to do it. But so we, we feel this... Imp we're impelled to always demonstrate this competence. So it's very... Uh, uh, useful to say no to these things, yeah, to say no, I can't do it. Just to stop and uh, have those limits, accept those limits of yourself. And then when we come to that day when you get up and you do nothing, yeah, and just doing nothing is a very good thing. I think maybe one of the the um, you know, I always kind of remember, have a memory. <clears throat> it's kind of a very vague memory in my mind of, of summer holidays when I was growing up. You know, as a, as a school schoolboy in uh, Perth, and uh, you got this kind of vague memory of kind of endless, long, hot afternoons. Yeah, with nothing to do. Yeah, and you get you get really kind of bored and listless. I never got that much bored, but just this kind of feeling of kind of endless stretches of time with nothing happening, and uh, it's kind of like this eternal. Thing. Maybe that's why I got into meditation. I don't know. I was off, it was summer holidays on, on the beach in Perth. Maybe something happened to my mind. But uh, so yeah, take the time to 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 go to the beach. Yeah, to to go to the park. Yeah, to go to nature and just to be and just to spend some time just looking at a tree or just sitting on the rocks. Yeah, and just watching the insects crawl around. And to really remind ourselves, actually, we're part of that. You know, we're not something separate. I'm not separate from those ants calling around here. Yeah, I'm not separate from the birds in the sky. We're not separate from the breezes and the winds and the waters. All of those are, are circulating within us. You know, the waters of the oceans are circulating within us, within our veins. And the act of stopping is one of the one of the most sacred things we can do. Yeah? God made the world in six days, the seventh day he rested. Yeah? And that, that resting, that, that, that doing nothing, that's the day which is sacred. Yeah? And so from a Buddhist point of view, of course, the, the, the external stopping, the stopping of work and external activities is only a, a, like a preparation. Yeah? The real stopping is the stopping that happens within the mind. Yeah? And as the, the first, first, very famous first line of the um, Yoga Sutra uh, says that the, the cessation of the activities of the mind is yoga, yeah? is meditation. So it's a very succinct definition of meditation, this, the stopping of the activities of the mind. So also to see that as being like a holiday, yeah? 
that you don't have to be thinking all the time. Yeah, you don't have to be uh, doing stuff. Yeah, you don't have to have this feeling of 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 uh, uh, being forced to solve problems all the time. Yeah? There's just something about stopping which is actually very nice. And uh, I felt, felt that the other day. I felt this kind of sense of relief. I've been been working on a book for the last few years, and as my, my books tend to do, it gets more and more complicated as things go on. And uh, <laughs> endless, you know, endless revisions and things like that. And then finally, I kind of decided to at least stop the, the first draft. And so I, I finished the first draft and then sent some copies around to some people to, to read it and give me some feedback and so on. And, and um, I felt that it's really kind of nice sense of relief. Oh, now I've kind of done that. I don't have to do anything, you know. I don't have to feel, oh, yeah, there's that chapter that needs reworking and I've got this bit and that bit and I need to check the footnotes on that. And so there's just this cessation. And even that, that's just only a small thing. But it's quite a, uh, it's quite a sense of ease, a sense of relief that comes from that. And so to notice that sense of ease and that sense that, ah, oh, of coming back into the mind, into oneself. As I was just discussing with Brett earlier, but that there's a uh, very interesting article in uh, one of the recent New Scientists, and it's talking about they, they've discovered these <coughs> previously unknown or unsuspected uh, neural networks in the brain, whereas previously they'd always... Uh, been investigating like what parts of the brain light up when you do certain things. So, for example, if you see, then, then it sort of activates certain parts of the brain. Or if you you know use language, then it might do certain other parts. Or if you play music, then certain other parts will work. So it's always like when when you're doing something, which parts of the brain are working. But now they've they've started to research what parts of the brain are working when you're not doing anything. Yeah, and they've 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 discovered to their surprise that the brain is actually working just as hard when you're not doing anything. Yeah? And these other networks and systems uh, come into play when the mind isn't actively engaged in things. Yeah? And so that this is only a very new finding, but they, they hypothesize that, that, this is, um, that this is like the, kind of the, the assimilation and integration of, of everything that's been happening, of your experiences and thoughts and so on and so forth, and then that's getting assimilated. Uh, in these periods when the mind isn't actively engaged in things. And so if that's the case, then that shows us that, that you know, when we spend all our... That's why we get so stressed out when we spend all our time doing stuff, yeah? and constantly being feeling like we have to do, 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 and there's no time to assimilate and rest and, and, and put, put the things back together. And that's just as important a time and just like in nature, that, that the winter time is just as important as the summer. Yeah? I mean, things grow in the summer and they're dormant in the winter. But the period of dormancy is just as important. Yeah? The night and the day. Yeah? All of these, these, these aspects are just each as important as the other. So it's unfortunate that we tend to um, <clears throat> you know, pay so much attention to the active side of things that that's what we do. That's what we are, you know. So you know, we define ourselves by a job. You know, you say, "I'm a, I'm a, I'm a mechanic. I'm a doctor. I'm a, I'm a, I'm an accountant. I'm a secretary, or whatever." Yeah, we have it defined by what our the thing that we do is. Yeah, couldn't we define ourselves by the things that we don't do? Yeah, say, "I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a quietist." Yeah, I'm somebody who likes to do nothing. It would be quite nice, wouldn't it? So to remember that, that you know, again, during this holiday period, that's something that we can use to, to do something wholesome and beneficial for ourselves and for others. We can, of course, we can and should do, you know, the conventional things like, you know, making contact with our family and all of those kinds of things, which are very, very, uh, very nice, which I'm doing over Christmas as well, visiting my mum in Penang. But, but also to realise that just the stopping itself is something that's very beautiful. It's not like a complete stopping, it's not like you never start again, but it's just like, ah, oh, it's okay to not do anything. Yeah? And yeah, fair enough, there's jobs that need to be done, but there's other jobs that have already been done, and those jobs are finished. Yeah? 
And so you can be happy about that. So this is just a few reflections for you for the Christmas break. So hopefully you have a very holy holiday. And uh, anyone have any comments or questions or reflections on it?